Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Knott, and I'm the dean of the USC Saul Price School of Public Policy. And on behalf of the school and USC, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this special lecture this evening. Uh, the Price School and the Fred W. Smith National Library have collaborated to establish the George Washington Leadership Lecture Series. This evening marks the first George Washington Leadership Lecture here at USC. The series brings together students, faculty, and the broader public to explore George Washington's numerous accomplishments and his incredible legacy for the country and his lasting impact and relevance for today. This partnership was made possible through the generous support of Mary Beth and William Borthwick. Uh, Mary Beth is a proud alumna of USC and vice regent of Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, this is the, a remarkable organization that governs and has governed the library for, from its inception. Uh, the museum, Mount Vernon, and the grounds. And it's a truly remarkable place, and I strongly encourage you all to visit. And we're very uh, fortunate to have William and Mary Beth here, so would you please stand and be recognized, and thank you so much for your generous support. So for our guests who have made the trip from Virginia, I want to uh, thank you especially. I know you have very busy schedules, and we deeply appreciate you taking part in tonight's event. Uh, I'm also guessing, this is just a guess, but that uh, you don't mind really swapping the cold East Coast weather for the 80 degree uh, sunny Southern California uh, weather. Now indeed, uh, all of us at the USC Price School are very proud to partner with the Fred W. Smith uh, National Library. And we're very excited to play a role in advancing the study of George Washington and promoting the values that he represented. At USC Price, our mission is to improve the quality of life for people and their communities. Through our research and through our education and teaching, we see to seek to reform governance, to plan and develop sustainable communities, and to improve the health and well-being of people and families. And in this process, we inspire and educate students to apply their passion, their creativity, and their knowledge to help make the world a better place. USC Price is an interdisciplinary school with academic programs in public administration, health policy and management, public policy, and urban planning and real estate development. We also provide ex exciting executive education programs uh, in leadership and management for prominent professionals in the public, nonprofit, and private sectors here in California and in other parts of the world. And for more than 80 years, we've served as a leader in public affairs education in the country. And currently, we're ranked number six uh, nationwide in US News and World Report. By weaving together related disciplines and reaching across the sectors, the public, nonprofit, and private sectors, our school is uniquely positioned, I believe, to address head on society's most pressing challenges and to discover exciting new opportunities. Now, in many ways, uh, and I was surprised to discover this, George Washington's interests and endeavors intersect with the various facets of the Price School as I just described them. George Washington is remembered for being a great leader as founder, a founding father of the Constitution and of course the first US president. But his impact on our country and his legacy goes far beyond that. Washington was also a surveyor. He was a military leader. He was a city planner who helped plan Washington, D.C. And he was a real estate developer in the western state of Ohio, uh, the colonial period's version of California. 
He envisioned the Potomac River as the main transportation route between East and West. And he instituted innovations in healthcare by uh, disease prevention uh, for the military and wound care and nutrition at Valley Forge, just to give a few examples of his innovative approaches across a variety of fields from transportation to real estate to healthcare to public policy and leadership. And in these ways, George Washington contributed greatly to shaping the fields in which our school conducts research and in which our students pursue careers. So that we hope through this collaborative lecture series, together we can promote a better understanding of Washington's incredible legacy and the enduring and universal importance of his ideas, his values, and his actions. And at this time, I'm very, very pleased to introduce one of tonight's distinguished speakers, Dr. Douglas Bradburn. Uh, Dr. Bradburn is the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington at Mount Vernon. He's a really well-known scholar of early American history. He has authored two books and numerous articles and book chapters on the history of the founding of the United States of America and the early history of the Chesapeake. Before coming to Mount Vernon, Dr. Bradburn served as a professor of history and director of graduate studies at Binghamton University, State University of New York, and he received in 2010 the Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. He's a native of Virginia, uh, who earned his PhD in history from the University of Chicago and his bachelor's degree in history and economics from the University of Virginia. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Douglas Bradburn. Thank you, Jack, very much, and thank everybody who helped put together this great evening tonight. Uh, we're going to have an excellent program for you. The first event held at the brand new facility of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, this new presidential library at Mount Vernon, was a USC event. Uh, and so that was exciting for us. A and uh, I, I think I mentioned at the time, I don't have any real USC connection, but I did go to a, a school called Walsingham Academy in Williamsburg, Virginia, and their uh, mascot is the Trojan. So I thought that that was uh, serendipitous uh, and exciting in its way. As I was thinking about why USC would be interested in George Washington, what the connection might be, and I, I thought maybe that, that someone high up in the boosters had heard about this 6'3 farm boy from Virginia with, uh, who was 240 pounds and could throw a uh, football across the Potomac and who never told a lie. So he'd be a perfect recruit for your program. But, uh, but the truth of this partnership, uh, it, in fact, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and let me step back a little bit and talk about the Mount Vernon Ladies Association briefly. The Mount Vernon Ladies Association of the Union is an extraordinary group of women who came together uh, in the 1850s when George Washington's house on the Potomac was falling into disrepair. And the owner of it at the time tried to sell it to the state of Virginia, tried to sell it to the Congress, uh, and they weren't interested. Uh, so this group of women uh, really created a national campaign to raise money to buy the house and save it for the American people, and that's just what they did. And this is at a time when women couldn't own property in many states and when women didn't certainly have the right to vote. Uh, so it's an extraordinary organization, uh, and you have this great USC alum who's one of the vice regents, the vice regent from California, uh, the funder of this program. Uh, yeah, well, there you go. Uh, so applause line, uh, uh, excellent. So uh, the great thing, so they save the house, and they, they hold the house in trust for the American people. They preserve it, and they interpret it, and they've brought back a lot of the furniture that uh, originally was held by the family. Uh, and really, at the beginning of the 21st century, they added uh, a plank to their mission, and that was an educational plank. It was, it was part of their mission now to educate the country and people around the world about George Washington and his legacy. And so the library, the new presidential li library, really comes out of that turn in the mission of this fantastic organization uh, that has been in existence for a long uh, period of time. And that's one of the things uh, that brings us uh, to today. And I think that uh, the, the lessons 
to be learned from George Washington uh, are uh, very uh, uh, prescient right now. It's a time for inspiration and a time for leadership. And uh, the story of George Washington is one that we all can learn from and be inspired about. And so USC and the Saul Price School represents a good partner from my point of view precisely for this reason. The Saul Price School wants to make the world a better place and wants to actively be engaged in making things easier for people. And that's exactly the story of George Washington. I mean, his vision was one to leave the world a better place than he found it. Uh, and so we want to educate people, but we don't just want to learn new things and tuck them away in a corner. We want to apply and inspire a new generation of leaders to look to the lessons and the continuities of the past as they try to solve the problems of the future. What I also appreciate about USC is it is an institution on the rise and really has been uh, uh, very dramatically, I think, for the last three decades or so. Uh, it is an institution of higher learning that is now world renowned uh, and is certainly one of the best uh, in the United States. Uh, and as far as the rankings go, you're high enough now where those rankings are really about a very small differences. You're in the conversation with some of the best institutions in the world. So that's exactly where George Washington desires to be uh, associated with excellence. And to become a great institution, it, it requires that kind of excellence. And excellence requires support from uh, many of its alum and donors, of course, but also from great leadership. Uh, and that's what you have here with Jack Knott. Uh, and you have here, well, Jack already learned the lesson of Washington, which is to be taller than everybody in the room. You know, that, so we can't all do that, but uh, that lesson number one, if you can be, be very tall, uh, and people will follow you around. So that's great. Uh, you know, no wigs. He never wore a wig. He powdered his hair, of course, as you do every day, I'm sure. So, uh, but, but so excellence also comes in other leaders, and it's my pleasure really to introduce uh, one of those who's been very important in the transformation of USC, and that's Dr. David Sloan. Uh, David is a new friend of mine and a delightful person in many ways, although he doesn't introduce me yet in that way, but he will learn to. Um, he, he's a professor uh, here at USC Price. Uh, he has a PhD in history uh, from Syracuse University, and so you know he's smart, first of all, because he has a PhD in history, which is the queen of the humanities and the conscience of the social sciences, but also because he got the hell out of Syracuse, which is uh, last week was negative 13 degrees. So uh, he's clearly a very bright person. Uh, he's a leading expert and scholar on American urban planning. Urban planning, public policy, community health planning in particular. His work on the history of hospitals is highly regarded around the world. And his recent book re release, uh, Planning Los Angeles, uh, uh, brings an extremely exciting inter interdisciplinary view to a fascinating story which affects everyone here uh, and, in fact, uh, helps us understand uh, modern America, I think. It, it's a brilliant uh, collection. USC's rise to excellence is greatly aided and was greatly aided by David's leadership of the USC undergraduate program, which he previously directed, the largest degree uh, granting program in the school, in which he transformed the curriculum so that USC undergrads are better prepared for graduate work or for professional work. But from my point of view, David is most special as the primary liaison uh, with Mount Vernon and the Fred W. Smith National Library as we develop uh, this exciting partnership uh, moving forward. And with his great interest in city planning, in public service, in good public policy, he shares that with Washington himself, although I can't vouch for his throwing arm. So please, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. David Sloan. It's really nice to see all of you here. We've been working on this for over a year now, and to have it finally begin, I think, is quite a delight. Uh, for all of us, uh, but particularly for me. A lot of emails, a lot of phone calls, a lot of visits, a lot of talk. And now we get to actually hear one of the great historians talk about the tie between the past and the present. I would uh, just have to echo the thanks to the Borthwicks for their support. And uh, and even though uh, I got in trouble because I told uh, Doug that my wife was delightful, and I didn't tell my wife that Doug was delightful, um, uh, <laughs> I told him I didn't know him that well yet. Uh, 
he is, it really has been a delight to get to know the people from Mount Vernon. It's an extraordinary organization. I think most of us who've been to Mount Vernon have been there once. And I got to tell you, to go back now, uh, I won't tell you the last time I went, it was when I was a little younger. And it's quite an amazing place. It's really a delightful place, but it's also a very substantial place. And in its grounds and now in the library, one can get a real sense of the role that Washington played in the development of our country and of our society. So when I uh, was asked by Dean Knott to oversee this development of this partnership from the USC uh, perspective and to begin planning the lecture series, um, I was immediately uh, reminded that my colleague, uh, one of the people who helped bring me to USC, uh, Kevin Starr, would be the perfect beginner, the first initiator of this partnership. Not only has Professor Starr had a distinguished career as a scholar, writing, among other things, his magnificent six-volume history of California that will long stand as the standard interpretation of the state's development. But he also has an illustrious career as a public librarian. Trained at the University of California, Berkeley in library science, Professor Starr served as the state librarian of California from 1994 to 2004, when Governor Schwarzenegger named him the state librarian emeritus. Uh, I could go on for a whole paragraph, I'm not gonna, uh, about what Kevin did during that time as state librarian. It's, it's, it's an extraordinary record of uh, bringing the, the state libraries back from some real difficulties and trying to create a financial foundation that would allow them to continue to support our, our state and our activities as a state for many, many years. Kevin embodies many of the same values that George Washington held dear. His love of his country, uh, the extraordinarily inquisitive mind, a remarkable generosity that I know served me well as a junior professor, an unusual willingness to move from the world of ideas to professional activity and back again, and throughout an ability to get things done. As a result, Professor Starr has been recognized by the University of Southern California as one of a small number of university professors and as a recipient of the university's highest award, the Presidential Medallion. And he's been, uh, no, he's been noted by his country as the 2005 National Endowment for the Humanities Medalist. Tonight, he introduces us to George Washington. And the way tonight will work is Kevin's going to come up and give his lecture. Then Doug and I are going to join him for some uh, conversation afterwards, at which point I will ask for questions from the audience after we've spent a little bit of time. He introduces us to George Washington through the lens of the frontier in his lecture, George Washington Looks West, an Enduring Preoccupation. Please join me in welcoming my friend and my colleague and an extraordinary man, Kevin Starr. Well, thank you, David. Uh, you mentioning those 10 wonderful years when I was state librarian uh, makes me regret that I'm not tonight because I used to come to groups like this and uh, vested in all the authority granted me by the state of California, give you all exemptions from any overdue book fines you might have in your, in your local library. But it was a wonderful period of time. I was librarian of San Francisco for some five years and, and librarian of the state of California. I'm an um, old-fashioned Democrat. I was appointed by a Republican governor, then reappointed by a Democratic governor, and then reappointed by a Republican governor, which uh, testifies to the flexibility of my political opinions. Uh, <laughs> like the Vicar of Bray, I stayed, stayed in office. And thank you for asking me to do this, uh, I th uh, uh, perform uh, to this uh, lecture because uh, it's an unexpected to me because I do not have a background uh, other than the normal requirements that one takes in getting a PhD uh, of a colonial background. But the whole idea of the West has been something on my mind and on the mind of a number of historians. And 
it was a delight initially for me to see the library uh, in, in Mount Vernon. It's just absolutely remarkably organized, beautifully uh, arranged, and some of the, to, uh, to see the range of Washington's own reading and annotation, annotations and in, 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 uh, some of his favorite books, et cetera, to see how that's a whole side of Washington that I think over time, I think the library will promote uh, further scholarship uh, in this area. Um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, my sense of Washington comes just basically from the standard biographies and from the ongoing addition of consulting over time of his, uh, of his papers from the University of Virginia. And of course the uh, 1,052 pages of his selected correspondence published in 1997 by the Library of America. And I recommend that to everyone here because it's a beautiful, beautiful edition. It'll bring, all, bring out another Washington to you, the Washington the writer, the master of a good, clear, workmanlike prose. It's making available a broad readership, to a broad readership, proof positive that the fatherhood of George Washington to this nation was a matter of, or, uh, the, uh, a matter of intellect and imagination as well as generalship and political genius. Um, since I'm a professional librarian then with a Master of Library Science degree from UC Berkeley and as I say, former city librarian and state librarian, I love to give references and miss my own reading and insights from Harvard Graduate School long, long ago. Uh, John Rodemel's uh, edition of Washington's Correspondence together with su its superb chronology as well as Ron Chernow's recent, uh, wa recent uh, Washington A Life uh, from the Penguin Press 2010, which took me about a year to read. Uh, it was so enjoyable to go back and read. Uh, it's filled with some delicious, delicious detail. And the Oxford Companion to American History, edited by Thomas H. Johnson and Harvey Wish, as well as Robert Hines and John Farragher's The American West, A New Interpretive History from the Yale University Press. These are the works that I went to to refer, uh, re, re, uh, resuscitate my sense of Washington. Now, all, all of us readily acknowledge the intellect and imagination of the other founding fathers, the intellect and imagination uh, of founding fathers and mothers. Mothers because we must include Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, Dolly Madison, and other great women of this era among the founders. But we sometimes overlook this imaginative and intellectual side of George Washington because, unlike so many other founding fathers, he did not attend Harvard, Yale, Princeton, King's College, later Columbia, or William and Mary, but acquired his learning from personal reading, as so beautifully documented in the library at Mount Vernon. An absorption of tradition and taste from his social environment, and I submit along with these and other influences from his lifelong relationship to the Western frontier, which as I shall hope to dramatize this evening, uh, was a continuing preoccupation across his adult life. Incidentally, in this regard, that, that sense of uh, attacking culture through reading autonomously, uh, is, of course, links him with, George, uh, with Abraham Lincoln and links, and as does the sense of the frontier. Now let's begin with Mount Vernon itself. Remembering that for all its restored elegance and all the elegance George Washington sought to bring to it in his lifetime, the furniture, draperies, china, crystal, and silverware he had imported from London or purchased from the finest purveyors in the, con in the colonies, Mount Vernon came into being as a simple, practical, wooden structure of Georgian design. Built in 1843 by Washington's half-brother Lawrence and rented from Lawrence's widow by George and Martha Washington until Washington inherited it, it in 1761. I was just mentioning that after going to Mount Vernon, our, our opening uh, uh, presentation of the, uh, with the Saul Price School and the library, my wife and I went out to Monticello and there could be no more greater contrast to the simple, practical, straightforward nature of Mount Vernon and the absolutely uh, idiosyncratic Jeffersonian nature of Monticello. Two, two, two important buildings, but both so, both so different. Now, I did say Georgian, didn't I? 
Harvard historian Bernard, Bayless, Bernard Balin tells us that while the built environment of the English-speaking North American colonies was smaller in scale and more practically oriented, perhaps, than the architecture of contemporary England, this colonial architecture nevertheless re-echoed the aesthetic impulses Georgian England and in the case of the Palladian grandeur of Jefferson's Monticello, perhaps even surpassed it. As Ron Chernow points out in his recent biography, Washington was astutely aware of the latest English trends in clothing, furniture, clothing incidentally. We have to always remember about Abe Lincoln, the braille splitter, etc. We have to always remember that he got his suits from Brooks Brothers. I think that's very important. Something about the American sensibility to remember that. His latest English trends, Washington in English clothing, furniture, and household design, and furnished his home and purchased the best clothes through London agents. Mount Vernon then is a blend, like Washington himself, of the Virginia Tideland culture of the 18th century, existing in a forest field energized on one side by Europe and on the other side by the western frontier that remains so close, even to this grand home overlooking the Potomac, whose headwaters Washington saw as the gateway to the western frontier, and whom upon when stepping down as commander in chief of the army would devote himself to the uh, effort to, build, to take that uh, river and to push it by a canal into the interior and connect it, uh, connect in effect uh, the, the Great Lakes, uh, the, the, the western uh, frontier uh, with, the, with the Atlantic. With the exception of a voyage to Barbados in September 1751 with his brother Lawrence, who was suffering from a chronic lung illness that was most likely tuberculosis, Washington never left the boundaries of North America. In Barbados, moreover, George Washington fell victim to smallpox, but recovered. The lifelong immunity he gained from this painful experience could very well have saved his life given the prevalence of that disease in the army camps of the 18th century. But never to visit Europe. Even later, after uh, putting down uh, the generalship, invited by Benjamin Franklin to Washington, beautiful letter that Franklin writes saying, come and we'll go on a triumphal tour, Cincinnati to the West, we'll go on a triumphal tour of Europe, they'll just love you everywhere. Well, uh, Franklin with his great sense of showmanship. My gosh, what he could have done on that triumphal tour with George Washington. But even when he had bested the British and gained a European-wide reputation as the Cincinnati of the West, as the English poet Lord Byron called him, referring to the Roman general who saved the Republic, then put all honors aside and returned to his plow and his farm. Just as Washington returned to Mount Vernon, come to Europe, as I say, Franklin uh, uh, said to him, and you will be acclaimed in capital after capital as the hero and avatar of what the contemporary Federalist poet Philip Freneau would call in his famous poem, The Rising Glory of America. Washington did not take up Franklin's offer, but dedicated himself to the restoration of Mount Vernon instead until the new republic called him to its presidency. England and Virginia, Virginia and the frontier, the wilderness that awaited in the West, Virginia as a creation of the English imagination. Washington came of age amidst these polarities. As I mentioned, he did not attend a university, but Mount Vernon itself, named in honor of the British Admiral commanding the 1740 expedition in the Caribbean attempting to capture Cartagena from the Spanish, a campaign in which Washington's half-brother Lawrence served, Mount Vernon provided a secondary and higher education to George Washington as he encountered it growing up, as Lawrence became his mentor and introduced him to the influential Fairfax family, connected to Thomas Lord Fairfax, proprietor of over five million acres in North Northern Virginia. One cannot emphasize the American nature of of, of what I just suggested, uh, that, that sense of, of, uh, of Virginia being his Harvard and Yale, like as for in Moby Dick, uh, Ishmael's Harvard and Yale was, was the Pequod, the whaling ship. And that sense then also of the upwardly mobile young man, 
or a woman, but in, well, woman in case of Sister Carrie Dreiser's novel, the upwardly mobile young American looking to that larger family, that a more established family, and then that family reaching uh, across and saying, yes, yes, you're a talented young man. Yes, you will go places. Yes, there will be things for you to do, or conversely, not saying that. I mean, it's in a half dozen great American novels, this theme. Lawrence's experiences under Admiral Vernon inspired a brief flirtation on young George's part with making a career in the Royal Navy. Had Washington done this, it would have, been, would have represented a dramatic move in the direction of England and not Virginia and its frontier to the west. Now, I don't know uh, if many, if any, uh, I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, American provincial who entered the Royal Navy, was commissioned, or at least who had a conspicuous career. It might have been the end of George Washington as we know it. He might have re retired as a half-pay captain to Bristol in some years uh, down the pike or perhaps serving uh, under Horatio Hornblower in the C.S. Uh, Forster novels. Had Washington entered the Royal Navy, one can speculate, he might, have, he might have overcome any prejudice against colonials, given his family connection to Lord Fairfax, and he might have risen to high command and rank or to reasonable command and rank. But then again, had this happened, uh, present-day Canada would extend as far south as the Florida Keys, and as far to the southwest as the University of Southern California. And in Moby Dick, as I suggest, Ishmael tells us that a whaling ship was his Harvard and his Yale. Mount Vernon, the Fairfax family, a state at Belvoir some four miles away, these were Washington's Harvard and Yale. His William and Mary, Belvoir especially, where Washington studied mathematics, surveying, and geography, along with legal forms and accounting as used in plantation business. Surveyor, an unacknowledged but virtually important profession in the American colonies and early republic. I would say, in fact, that surveyors were to the founding of the early republic what developers were to the founding of Southern California. Two unacknowledged uh, groups. Uh, uh, and in the far west and southwest, of course, also as well, remaining crucial into the 20th century. Think of the surveyorship of Jasper O'Farrell here in the last years of Mexican hegemony and the early years of the American uh, dominance of California. By its very definition, its very operation, as young George Washington encountered it, surveyorship involved an intellectual and imaginative as well as professional relationship to the frontier at a time when the western boundaries of the English-speaking North American colonies extended westward to an infinite terminus, or for, to a non-terminus, just extended into an indefinite west. I say indefinite because the precise extent of the North American continent remained unknown until the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1804-1806, these indefinite western borders. Each colony then was by definition, of course, and Virginia especially, each colony then was by definition of the original colonies a western place, had a west at least in its imagination. You see this in Jefferson's wonderful notes on the present state of Virginia. So then at age 16, soon 17, in March and April 1748, Washington joined George William Fairfax on a surveying expedition of the Fairfax lands in the Shenandoah Valley. Had he, here he encountered the frontier environment in which he would soon be making his military reputation as well as the frontier settlers and their stable workforce who would eventually form a significant portion of his militia and later the Continental Army, and the Native Americans, whom as President of the United States he would make every effort to bring into per peaceful relationship with the new American Republic, and of course the marvelous series of portraits of leading chiefs in his presidency wearing their George Washington medal, the medal pre presented them by Washington. Ages 16 and 17. What a transformative period in any young man or any young woman's life. This is the time he might have been at William and Mary, as Thomas Jefferson would be, 
But these Western lands and this profession constituted a comparable instance of higher education through pragmatic experience involving intellectual application and mathematical reflection. It also involved, I believe, at whatever subconscious level, the absorption by Washington of a certain ethos that was intrinsic to the colonial experience itself. Had Washington studied the classics at William and Mary, he might have encountered the Western Isles as described by the Roman poets. Had he been reading history at William and Mary and had his professors there been aware of antiquarian researches underway in England, he might have also have known just how powerful the myth of these Western Isles, uh, now located in the mid and far Atlantic, were to the, uh, was to the Middle Ages and early modern era. Indeed, in the 1720s, the Anglo-Irish philosopher and Anglican clergyman George Berkeley, pronounced Berkeley, Latin, uh, we pronounce it Berkeley, later Bishop of Clone in Ireland, spent a number of years in Bermuda and Newport, Rhode Island, in an effort to found a college that would train missionary clergymen for the American frontier. Berkeley believed that the future of Anglo-American civilization was in the New World, and wrote a very well-known poem to this effect in which he concluded that there shall be sung another golden age, the rise of empire and the arts, the good and the great, inspiring epic rage, the wisest heads and noblest hearts, not since as Europe breeds in her decay, such as she bred when fresh and young, when heavenly flame did animate her clay, by future poets shall be sung. Westward, the course of empire takes its way. The first four acts already passed. A fifth shall close the drama with the day. Time's noblest offspring is the last. Whether or not George Washington knew this poem, and I suspect he did, and there's a remote possibility that he did, in fact, another talented colonial by the name of Benjamin Franklin, then living in London, testified to Parliament in the early 1760s that if Great Britain properly developed its American empire, preserving the liberties of its inhabitants, and at this point, Franklin pointed to a map of North America, his finger touching somewhere into the interior around the future city of Chicago, one can imagine. Someday, said Franklin, the very center of the British Empire, a new London, would be in the center of the American continent. A crucial figure in the history of the emergence of American identity is the British colonial gentry. Uh, among the British colonial gentry was William Byrd II, a London-educated Virginian, graduate of law from the Middle Temple, indeed a corresponding member of the Royal Society who chronicled the surveying expedition he led along the Virginia-Carolina border in the early 1700s in the history of the dividing line which although not published until 1841, reveals in retrospect, Byrd, the polished Virginian, the friend of playwrights, play, playwrights Wickerly and Congreve, the owner of, of a 4,000 volume private library, the largest in the colonies at the time, he encountered a new reality, a new identity, as he labored in the wilderness with his surveying party, encountering like Washington would at 16 and 17, a reality, and an identity far from London and suggesting the possibilities of colonial America at, such, it's at some future phase of expanded identity. All this is to suggest that the myth of the West was extant in the early and mid 18th century, whether or not it was known or exactly how it was known to young George Washington. There are some who speculate that Washington's connection to the Masonic movement, and we must remember that in the 18th century, Masonry was itself a pan-European movement of great importance to educated and self-educated American colonials alike, that Washington's connection to the Masonic movement involved a fusion of Masonic idealism and a Western setting. Masonic idealism fused with the West, we Californians, of course, are aware of this as the, we see the uh, Masonic lodges from 1849, 1850, 1851 decorate uh, our first uh, gold rush landscapes. 
It is always difficult to trace later beliefs and practices back to adolescence and young manhood. But it is also dangerous to ignore such impressions completely when considering the later beliefs and imaginative affinities of adult life. George Washington, investor in frontier properties, this can of course be explained strictly in terms of financial considerations. But was it linked as well to this youthful experience of the frontier as a surveyor, followed by Washington's own meteoric rise as a militia officer, starting with his appointment to the Virginia militia in 1752, and his extraordinary leadership the following year of an expedition commissioned by Lieutenant Governor Robert Dinwiddie, Dinwiddie the highest ranking British official residing in Virginia to demand of the commander of French forces in the Ohio Valley the withdrawal of all such forces from territory claimed by Great Britain, as well as to confer with the leaders of the Iroquois Six Nations regarding their intentions towards the English colonies. And this expedition, followed by Washington's leadership in 1754, now as Lieutenant Colonel of Militia, of a reconnaissance in force into the same disputed Western territory, resulting in a controversial battle uh, with Washington ordering the first shots, inaugurating the French and Indian War. <clears throat> I heard bullets whistle, Washington wrote his brother John Augustine, and believe me, there is something charming in the sound. True, Washington was forced to surrender to the French, the Fort Necessity he built at Great Meadows on the Pennsylvania border, but his conduct that year made him both famous or infamous, depending on whether one were French or English. One year later, it was now 1755, Washington, who had resigned from the Virginia militia rather than take a reduction in rank, to captain <clears throat> due to a reorganization, volunteered to serve as aide without rank or pay to General Braddock, commander of British forces in North America. Once again, Washington found himself on the far western frontier, and when on 9 July 1755, Braddock's forces of 1,450 men crossing the Mongahela River seven miles from Fort Duquesne at the fork of the Ohio, was attacked and defeated by a French and Indian force. With Braddock mortally wounded, Washington won a colonel's commission with his daring and bravery under fire and his management of the British retreat. Here then was a militia officer who entered the militia as a major with no prior experience, who had recently resigned from the militia rather than accept a motion from major to captain, proving not only brave under fire, he had had two horses shot from under him and his clothing was pierced by four bullets, but astute in the management of troops in the field under the most, what military historians and theorists uh, consider the most difficult condition of re retreat under conditions of defeat. If Mount Vernon and surveyorship provided Washington with his higher education, Braddock's defeat on the far frontier Washington incidentally sought to Braddock's secret burial so that the loss of the British commander might not be known. Braddock's defeat on the far frontier constituted Washington's transformative education, his West Point, if you will, his command and staff college as commander in the field. We all know Charles Wilson Peale's portrait of George Washington in his red and blue British uniform as colonel in the Virginia regiment. How perfectly commanding he appears, yet how fitting as well is Peel's depiction of Colonel Washington so appropriately framed against a deep background of frontier and western sky. For there, and not on the battlefields of Europe, did Washington come into that phase of his identity, commanding officer under fire in dire circumstances, manager of strategic withdrawal and surprise attack that in the long run ensured the success of the American Revolution. Once again, incidentally, as in the case of the Royal Navy, we are very lucky that George Washington was not taken into the regular British Army, as might have happened, but remained in a Virginia regiment, although he was peeved at this, to put it mildly. Like the Royal Navy, the regular British Army might very well have sent him to far distant places where he would have been at a time when he was most sorely needed by North American, 
by the North American colonies in rebellion. Incidentally, and I make these remarks in parentheses and aside, Benjamin Franklin had similar experienced a quantum leak, similarly experienced a quantum leak in leadership and prominence when he helped the Quaker colony of Pennsylvania organize its frontier defenses during an Indian uprising. Aside from the crucial victory at Fort Ticonderoga at the outbreak of the revolution in which uh, Colonels Benedict Arnold, Ethan Allen, and Henry Knox so distinguished themselves, it would be impossible to make a case for the colonies prevailing in the Revolutionary War against Great Britain because of decisive battles on the western frontier. The English were allied to the Iroquois Six Nations and other tribes as exemplified in the generalship of the Anglo-Mohawk Iroquois leader Joseph Brandt, which kept the frontier in a state of upheaval which was definitely not favorable to the colonies. I think it's safe to say, however, that Washington was forced to fight the first half of the revolution in the northeastern areas of population density and the second half of the revolution in the American South, in which an early phase of guerrilla warfare saw most of the far frontier, small farm holding anti-slavery southerners align with the British, followed by the almost European style siege at Yorktown, in which Washington willingly yielded authority to Rochambeau when it, when it came to matters of European style siege warfare. Nor was George Washington present during the Articles of Confederation when two astounding laws were passed by Congress, the Land Ordinance of 1785 and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, sort of ordinances that fulfilled Washington's own investment career and belief in this region. Through the Land Ordinance of 1785, the coastal colonies, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, ceded their western territories for the creation of new states, starting with the admission of Kentucky in 1792 from territories ceded by Virginia. Under the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, this vast territory was surveyed and set up for sale to the American people. From this region were created the states of Ohio, 1803, Indiana, 1816, Illinois, 1818, Michigan, 1837, and Wisconsin, 1848. Both these acts, for whatever self-interest were involved, and self-interest is never not involved in politics, set up what is to me an astonishing relationship to the unsettled, undeveloped North American continent which would eventually include the lands acquired through the Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican War, the Gatson Purchase in Arizona, and the successful negotiation of the U.S.-Canadian border dispute uh, regarding the Oregon Territory. Namely, that the continent itself was held in trust by the federal government for the people of the United States. George Washington was a force in American life when these decisions were made. And although he was not president of a not yet established Republic of the United States, these two land acts indicated that Washington's values regarding the importance of Western territories acquired not through private investment as Washington had acquired his territories, these lands remained in private hands, but acquired through treaty or national purchase, that these lands would be made available over time to the people of the United States. And when we say this, we must acknowledge the fact that the people included millions of immigrants who had not yet arrived. Such immigrant Americans, in fact, would continue to arrive through the 19th century, and thanks to the Morale Land Grant Act of 1862, would be able to receive land grants from the public domain, which they could earn through residence development and sweat equity. When we think of this, remember the movie The Patriot, starring Mel Gibson. One of the leading British officers in the film has been promised to be made the Duke of Ohio following the successful suppression of the rebellion. As humorous as this might seem to contemporary American audiences, it does reflect the fact that the lands of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 were owned by the British Crown and very well could have been granted in such a way if the American Revolution had failed, and we sort of would have Downton Abbey set 
in Ohio or Wisconsin. In other words, Washington's sense of the westward course of American development was shared by a, a decisive portion of the Congress in the waning years of the Articles of Confederation. In this instance, the thought of Thomas Jefferson, President Washington's first Secretary of State in Washington, partially overlapped for Jefferson had envisioned westward expansion in his book, Notes on the Present State of Virginia, 1784, and as a member of Congress had played an important role outlining the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Jefferson would also, of course, negotiate the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 and commission the Lewis and Clark Expedition of 1804-1806. During Washington's first administration, moreover, the Indian Intercourse Act of 1790 was passed, making it official federal policy to, quote, promote civilization among the friendly Indian tribes. The act authorized Washington to furnish Indian peoples whatever, quote, useful domestic animals and implements of husbandry, quote, they needed to make a peaceful transition to farmers and citizens of the new republic. Also established, this in 1792, was the federal peace medallion, depicting George Washington as president, smoking the pipe of peace with Native American leaders. It did not turn out fully that way, of course, despite the best intentions of Washington as great white father. But it represented an ideal that fused Federalist and Democratic Republican, that is to say Jeffersonian attitudes towards the far frontier. Had these intentions been more fully realized, a hundred years of tragic conflict, as well as issues that remain unresolved to this day, might have been mitigated if not avoided. And yet this hope for the advance of civilization across the American frontier remained an important impulse in American life and public policy, however compromised. When he was a, a boy of 12, the future New York writer Washington Irving, named in honor of the president, was patted on the head and had his hand shaken by Washington himself. In one sense, Irving, as visitor to the Indian territories in the 1830s and tireless historian of the West carried on through history, Washington's sense of Western destiny, which becoming the manifest destiny of the mid-1840s, extended the boundaries of the Republic from sea to shining sea. I link this point of view with, to Washington, incidentally, because Jefferson speculated that from 12 to 13 republics would grow up within the present-day boundaries of the United States. As a Federalist, however, Washington espoused and indeed took the first steps to implement a more federally focused national policy, which Washington Irving, a kind of surviving Federalist beyond the Federalist era, espoused. In any event, the Republic, which Washington more than any other figure helped bring into being, would in the decades to come, not always fairly, mind you, but consistently serve as the midwife of the Western identity of these United States. From this perspective, we can link imaginatively, at least, whatever it was the young Washington experienced when he first went out into the western frontier as a teenager with a sense of manifest destiny that between 1846 and 1850 brought California into the Union, which in time, in 1880, nurtured the rise of the University of Southern California, a research and teaching institution what was once the far, far frontier and which now through teaching and research is honored to serve that republic whose enduring father lived and died in Mount Vernon, which so embodies his legacy. I would like to leave you with one image and reference to one seminal speech by way of triangulating back to the theme of George Washington and the West. I just mentioned Washington Irving in his spectacular writings on the West. I would like to point out, however, that when Irving went out into the Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma, in order to reacquaint himself with the American frontier after 20 years of life in London and Sp England and Spain, he featured a tirely especially tailored for him by his London tailors on Seville Road. And his horse was outfitted with a specially made English saddle. Keep this imagery in mind, this juxtaposition of civility 
elegance, England and Europe played off against the Western American frontier. As I now shift the scene to the annual meeting of the American Historical Association, held in the year 1894 in Chicago at the Columbian Exposition, at this meeting, a young assistant professor of history at the University of Wisconsin by the name of Frederick Jackson Turner gave the keynote address entitled The Frontier in American History. In this address, Turner postulated that the frontier experience was the key determinant in the transformation of colonial settlers and the immigrants of the 19th century into a new social and cultural type, the American. 120 years later, scholars are still probing the truth or near truth or non-truth of the Turner thesis, as it is called. Later in his career, Turner went on to examine not just the far western frontier, but some of the frontiers of the colonial period, most notably the Massachusetts frontier. In these colonial frontiers, Turner found an interaction, an intersection of English and Euro of European and English culture and social forms and new departures. That, I believe, is how we must finally try to place the persistently enigmatic George Washington into cultural perspective. For all of its elegance and in institutional development, for all the learning of its intellectual leadership, those founding fathers who, the, the, who, who went on themselves to write the Constitution and four of them to serve as President of the Republic, for all the elegance of its Georgian architecture, the Virginia that nurtured the development of George Washington and his contemporaries was at once a colony, which is to say a civilization reflective of the high forms, reflective of the high forms of its parent civilization and a frontier, which is to say a society in a process of social development that was subtly modifying important, imported colonial forms. Thus the blended accomplishments of George Washington. He was a superb dancer and throughout his life he loved to dance. But he was also a magnificent horseman and a crack shot. He was a working farmer committed to the development of Mount Vernon but he also scoured the London catalogs for the latest in fashions and furnishings. In his development as a militia officer, he studied some of the classic manuals of military drill, and during the revolution, he welcomed into the Continental Army nobly born, or allegedly nobly born, European officers educated in the finest military academies of Europe. But he also understood how, on the frontier, wars were fought from secret and protected places. How armies had to keep moving in the forest. How rough and ready frontiersmen had to be motivated and managed. Perhaps that is why, at least partially why, he turned down Franklin's offer of a triumphal European tour. His focus was not Europe or England as much as he respected these cultures and appreciated their intellectual and artistic achievement. Something else had formed him as well and was still calling him into his presidency and following that into his all too brief uh, retirement. Was that something the frontier to the West, now extending into the Northwest territory of the Ohio? Who knows? Suffice it to say the question can be asked. After all, Washington, as I say, was president of an investor in the Potomac Company created in 1785 to make the Potomac River more navigable to commerce. And incidentally, one of the first two American ships to sail off Southern California in the early 1790s bore the name Lady Washington in honor of his beloved wife. Thank you very much. I would like to go back to that paradox that between the culture of Europe and the instability and opportunity and danger of the frontier and how that plays such a role um, in the formation of the United States as we imagine it uh, by the end of Washington's life. I was reminded earlier today that uh, by Doug that uh, we are moving in on the 250th anniversary of the coming of the revolution uh, with 
the 1760s, the format of the 1760s, the Stamp Act crisis, and the other uh, preceding events that are going to begin the march towards revolution. And this is right there at this time. So my question is to both of you, actually, not just to Kevin, but how do you think that this paradox plays a role in how we imagine the development of that society, political institutions, the, the culture of our society? I think, it's, I think it's fundamental to the formation of the English-speaking North American sensibility that eventually led into the American sensibility. If you look at the colonial figures uh, from the 17th uh, century, uh, they're, they're living in, a, in, say, Boston, very simple circumstances, a small town, and yet uh, they're, they're writing pamphlets disputing what Carl, Cardinal Bellarmine said in his latest book, etc. Uh, or they're uh, writing uh, poems uh, like Aunt Bradstreet, etc., with echoes of, of, high, of high English uh, poetry. Or like a little later, Cotton Mather, they're uh, writing great epics of American um, experience, the Magnalia Christi Americana. So I think that idea of juxtap that juxtaposition is right at the core of American identity. I remember the very moving uh, time when I first saw Thomas Jefferson's um, Hermitage, correction, Andrew Jackson's Hermitage, which opens up F. Scott Fitzgerald's the, uh, the Last Tycoon. And there on top of the hill was the cabin, the log cabin that he lived and where he lived with Rachel. Of course, Rachel had passed by the time he became president. And then down below was the beautiful plantation home and the gardens, etc. And in the, in the cabin uh, were, uh, were letters, and one of the letters was to Rachel. Didn't exactly say, don't be smoking a corn cob pipe, please. He, but he did say, you're now the wife of a major general. He was down in, in, uh, in Florida as major general. You're now the wife of Major General. You're entitled to this kind of treatment, that treatment. Of course, he's, so I think that juxtaposition is, is very important. Uh, I try to suggest it's in the American novel. It's in, in Bruce, Bruce Tarkington. It's in, it's in the uh, uh, films like The Magnificent Ambersons. It's in uh, the novels of John P. Marquand. And for those of us from the 1960s, it's it's in the Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons singing, Dawn, do go away from me. Think, think what your future will be with a poor boy like me. It's a great American theme uh, because it suggests both the luxuriance of the past, the recaptured luxuriance here in the, in the, in the present, and yet the, the sort of existential, if you can almost use the word frontier circumstances of new beginnings. Well, who can compete with that? I mean, you're going to quote from songs from the 60s. Uh, uh, first off, congratulations on the talk. It's a fantastic overview and broad uh, and deep, interesting way to understand Washington. You clearly proved your point of his deep commitment and relationship to the West. Now, the question, uh, the colonials are provincials in, in all that that means. They're not at the center of things. They have a place that they're emulating. Uh, and they're emulating it in many ways uh, in their society, in fashion, of course, but also in what they believe the order of things should look like. And what you see in, in the development of America over the course of the 18th century in particular, uh, and it gets articulated in many ways in the revolution, is this growing disparity between what you think the world should look like and what it actually looks like. So when you take Virginia, and Washington himself, who's aspiring in a Virginia gentry, sometimes called the Virginia aristocracy, uh, which is a complete misnomer because they're not a true aristocracy in the British sense. They're not hereditary. Uh, they don't have hereditary rule based in law. And the houses that they build, even the grandest houses, you take something like Shirley Plantation on the James River, and you compare that to a house built at the same time like Blenheim in England. That's where a true aristocracy lives, right? So that disparity on the one hand between we want to be an aristocracy, we want to pretend like we're an aristocracy, we want to, we want to purchase all their, uh, their fashions and, and have a social structure that reflects it, and the reality that America isn't that. Uh, there's a much broader base of property ownership, even in Virginia, uh, and particularly in the West. Uh, you know, Washington's first experience across the mountain in the Shenandoah Valley 
is an experience of a much more diverse economy, of a much more diverse society. There's people there from Germany, there's people there who are Scots-Irish, they're Presbyterians, there are these crazy dunkers running around. Uh, there's all sorts there, and then he's given the charge to uh, protect these people, people that he doesn't particularly like in many ways. And, uh, you know, and it's that, it is that paradox. It's absolutely there in America on the one hand, they're striving to be recognized as sophisticated, but on the other hand, the reality of the leveling that has happened in the settling and development of a country that, that allows merit to rise up and isn't overloaded with all these kind of ancient uh, uh, perquisites and laws. And, and, and that's part of what the revolution is about, although that insecurity lasts in many ways. And I would suggest, um, one way to think about the revolution is really uh, the embracing of that Republican turn, the idea that you don't need a monarch to be at the top of the hierarchy that you're all starting to fit into. What you need is a citizenry of equal Republican citizens uh, that can be independent. Uh, and so Monticello, as it ultimately gets created, is based on a Palladian villa. It's based on a Republican world of Venice, a Venetian Republican world, and that's that claiming of the Republican uh, heritage of Europe that you really see emerging through the revolution. And Washington does it as well in his new room. Uh, when he comes back from the war, finally, he's got this room that he started building in 1775, and it's the biggest room in the house, and it's basically just a bunch of boards, and, and uh, they get the studs up, and then he goes off to war, and it stays like that for a decade. Uh, when he finally gets back uh, and he starts putting it to back together, he decorates it in the latest fashions of Republican Rome that are becoming known because of the dig at Pompeii. So, you know, he, he's looking to a Republican model as he's also looking for the fashion of the European world. So that, that, uh, that transformation from a monarchical to a Republican uh, movement is, is crucial in that. Uh, uh, but you're absolutely right. That, that dynamic is always there between the the provincial uh, and uh, the ideal and, and what really there is. Comment, Kevin? No, I, that's wonderful. That's absolutely uh, okay. beautifully, beautifully said. The, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of asking a question uh, yeah. uh, of you. Was there a lot of uh, uh, reference to the crown before that? Mm. Or was there a sort of a latent republicanism in, in, the, in the colonies, say, in the 1730s, yeah. 40s, 50s? Or, or were they all very happy to be present, have their daughter presented at court, if, if that could be done? Well, well, there's two different arguments about this in the field right now. Some people argue that Americans were actually better monarchists than the people in London who were close to the throne and knew what a mess it was. You know? And when you can imagine this kingly patriot king out there who represents all the morality and virtue that you strive for, uh, that's a safe vision and it's one that to emulate. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's clear that Americans were consuming a particular political literature that was, its roots came out of Republican Rome uh, and, it, and, it, and uh, it translated through an English world, the, the Whig oppositional world, which was very much about the need to rebalance the English Constitution because it was corrupt and to bring back virtuous public citizens. Now this can go in two directions. One could be you asked for a virtuous patriot king to kind of step in and save the balance of the Constitution. The other could be reform the Constitution, allow people, uh, more people to vote, you know, a more kind of libertarian model of, you know, more independence. And, and so that's the Republican strain that was, you know, uh, you know, very much consumed and out there. But the crown was important because they never abandoned the crown until the last moment. There was always a, a notion that you could you could basically have the crown out there and then get parliament out of the way and run your own affairs. And it isn't until Tom Paine, who of course is, you know, he's, he's, his, his milieu is radical London. You know, he's coming from a completely different world. When he arrives in America and writes Common Sense, a book that Washington uh, made sure was read to the troops that he was now leading, which argued that monarchies were absurd, that it's absurd that you would uh, presume that somebody's children would be as good as they were at what they did and you shouldn't have hereditary power. So he assaulted the whole basis of monarchy and it's really that moment that, that all these latent tendencies are sort of brought together. So I think that's part of the struggle, the same part of the struggle of the, 
uh, what should things be like, and then what are you actually seeing around you? I must confess a certain amount of, of, of sympathy for King George, at least in the movie, The Madness of King George, <laughs> yeah. when he said, oh, yeah. he said, things have never been the same since we lost America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine why. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn yeah. to you, and um, i got one more question, then I'm going to ask if you have questions, or if Doug has a question for Kevin. But I do want to ask one other set of questions, or one, uh, another, if you will, to me, fascinating thing. And that is, I think most Americans, when they think of Washington, think of a president. Mm. And they have this sort of fixed image of Washington, maybe, maybe the cherry tree thing a little bit. But most of us think of the, the older statesmen with the powdered hair and this. And I, I, when, Kevin first, uh, when I first read Kevin's talk, I was reminded of a moment I had many, many years ago mm. when I imagined the 16-year-old leaving home and going into the Shenandoah Valley. Mm -hmm. you know, this is like going uh, a kid from California going to Brazil. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is a long ways from home into an area that is some, it's just out there. And, and it's very much. And I'm curious about the image of Washington and how we think of him both through Mount Vernon and as historians, and how, we, how in some sense we, we could reconnect to him as this adventurous mm -hmm. young man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he is a person, I mean, it's one of those things. We, we tend to think of uh, Franklin as the adventurer in, in Paris, and, and Washington is the the homebody mm -hmm. uh, staying at Mount Vernon. But in some sense, he's a very adventurous guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I, I think, David, that this kind of adolescent psychology uh, uh, on the part of historians is rather a new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Parson Weems gives us a, a cardboard boy who says, I, I, I chopped down the, the cherry tree, etc." I, I think that the, 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 what you're talking about is more, uh, more a, a result of, of later later historians, almost really since World War II, maybe even, mm. even more recent than that. Uh, the, uh, the sense of, we have a much more of a sense of developmental psychology, we have a more of a sense of family formation and uh, the importance of, of, uh, of young people. The minute I say that, of course, we have in the case uh, of uh, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn, we have, uh, if uh, Hemingway says, uh, suggests that all American the great American novel come, starts from Huckleberry Finn. Well, we have then from that period, what, the 1880s, we have an adolescent uh, mm -hmm. given to us as, a, as, a, as a, a great American icon. But I think as time goes on and we look more at our, uh, our these figures and, and respectfully invade, or not invade, but respectfully look at the enigmatic and concealed private natures of their lives, uh, whether it be Lincoln or Washington, the first temptation is to get the drop on these figures. Oh well, Andrew Jackson did this, or Abraham Lincoln was a manic depressive, or uh, whatever. Uh, but as time goes on, we begin to uh, see much more of complex psychology of these individuals, to, to include Jefferson, etc. And I saw, I think history will do more of this uh, in, in the future. Not to reduce them to psychological terms, but through the literary art, the imaginative art of history, suggests the development of these great men and women. Hmm. Washington did so much. It's so difficult for people to really come to grips, I think, with the whole arc of his story. But I think what Kevin showed us, too, though, is that that early period was so formative in his thinking about the potential of the country, but also the development of his own <coughs> leadership ability. When he went out when he was 16 and he crossed the Shenandoah uh, Valley and you know he he describes in his journal how he goes into this house and he has to sleep on this ratty wool bed and it's filled with fleas and lice and he you know he takes off his clothes like he's getting into a normal bed and he immediately realizes that was the worst possible thing he could do and he writes in his journal I won't do that again you know so I mean he's just uh, he's extraordinary. He says, I'm not as good of a woodsman as the rest of the guys. And then you look, flash forward to the moment when he's, he's been a surveyor now, and now he gets the commission to take the message to the French in the Ohio Valley, and it's the middle of the winter. And he has to go on foot from Williamsburg 
to basically almost uh, Lake Erie, and there's no roads, and there's uh, no sustenance after that you can't find from the woods or bring with you. And he goes with uh, Christopher Gist, and he falls into a river at a certain point, and he kind of pops out of nowhere to this French fort, and they're like, who's this guy? Uh, I mean, it, it's an extraordinary story of, of exploration, uh, you know, of uh, fortitude, and, and he delivers the message. They have all the civilities, and then he has to go back, and it's still winter. You know, uh, and so it's, it's extraordinary. And then his service in the French and Indian War, where he's essentially undermanned and trying to cover a series of forts throughout the Shenandoah Valley and into what is West Virginia uh, to stop Native American raiding that's going on. I mean, there's episodes there right out of any American Western, like the searchers. I mean, he leads a bunch of guys to get captives back that have recently been taken numerous times. I mean, so he, you know, he, he is the sort of American Western figure that nobody really knows that he is. And, uh, uh, you know, and that's, that's really a Washington that is crucial to what he's able to do in the revolution later because he, he's so young. I mean, he's, already, he's only 26 when he resigns his commission in the French and Indian War. And then he's, he, you know, he does not called to serve in that way again until 1775, so until he's 42, when he becomes the head of the, uh, of the Continental Army around Boston. And, and, and so it's that early years of, of, uh, of learning that, that really creates the man that's able to handle the adversity of uh, the American Revolution, which they shouldn't have won. You know? I think one of the uh, lovely things in terms of psychological complexity, one of the things that I loved about the Chernow biography is he chronicles in a very tasteful way that Washington was a, in love with his wife, was a, a, a faithful to his wife, but he had a sensibility to, uh, uh, he was very sensitive to women. Mm -hmm. And obviously to Mrs. F uh, Lady Fairfax, he was uh, deeply emotionally attached. And later was it Mrs. Powell uh, in his later life, uh, mm -hmm. uh, became a very good friend. And of course he shared that with um, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, mm -hmm. Although it's hard to imagine Washington, like Benjamin Franklin sitting in Paris next to the great beauty, Madame Helvetius, leaning over and saying to her, ah, oh, madam, he said, to be 70 again. <laughs> oh, and with, I'll be there. <laughs> and with that, uh, we'd like to open it up to you and see if you have a question for the, there's a couple of mics coming around. Uh, and if you have, a, I have other questions if you don't, but I'm happy to have you ask questions. Unfortunately, I'm an historian, so I could do this for a long time. Um, so maybe perhaps better you. We'll give you a moment. Anyone? No questions? Come on. There you go. Did, did George Washington speak to any mentors uh, in his journals? Who did he look up to as a young man? And who did he model himself after, if anyone? Or was he just a, an individual from the beginning uh, of his life throughout? Well, I'll just guess as a librarian, he certainly read the classics and he read the received literature, Shakespeare, Cervantes, Richardson, Fielding. He read that he was very interested in, in what was the, what we might call the, the early modern period in, in writing and obviously the classics as well. There's a, mm -hmm. At Mount Vernon they have a beautiful, uh, a museum, they have a beautiful display of his personal books. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would, I, I would say that he was, but in terms of sort of modeling himself, there's another aspect too that uh, in terms of say the, his formation through, the, through masonry, mm -hmm. I'm not a mason myself mm -hmm. so I don't know that what the particular ethical or moral formations mm -hmm. that came from masonry, but 18th century masonry was not just uh, people running around with a fez hat and at a convention, etc. I mean, Mozart was a mason, uh, the the arch, uh, Archbishop of, of, of he belonged to the same lodge as the Archbishop of Vienna. It was a mm -hmm. it was a elite group with a very highly developed ethical and and theory of history. So I think if I knew more about masonry and if Washington had not been such a good mason, so as not to document the influence of masonry on him, I tend to think that masonry formed a lot of his um, formation. I, I believe that's right. The Masonic influence was powerful in Washington, and the Masonic. Uh, uh, what masonry is about is about self-improvement. It's about becoming a better man and there's different levels that you work through uh, that are basically different kinds of morality. Now he had, uh, he had a number of mentors and guides in his life 
uh, that he wrote about and that he, he uh, was around. One was Lord Fairfax, that uh, Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, and Lord Fairfax's son and nephews, who tended to be around uh, Belvoir Planta Plantation, which is just uh, down the street. And that's where he, he experienced and emulated a lot of uh, gentlemanly behavior, genteel behavior. His own father died when he was 10. So his half-brother Lawrence he looked up to, but his half-brother Lawrence died as well. So he, he, to make it in Virginia in the gentry, you need to have a patron, and you need to have a powerful patron. And he lost the, the most important ones right away. So he had to learn how to work uh, with people that weren't related to him and prove to them that he was worthy of their, their patronage. And he clearly did that early on through the Fairfaxes, and that was crucial. But this, this emphasis on sort of his mental universe and what he was reading and what was important to him is crucial. Uh, and so his favorite play, he loved plays, his favorite play that he, he acted in with the Fairfaxes and he actually had it performed by his officers at Valley Forge and he would write letters when he was on the French and Indian War to people, was quoting things out of it, is a play by Addison called Cato and it's about the story of the great uh, stoic Cato, of course, who uh, rather than become uh, rather than uh, allow Caesar to claim power, kills himself uh, in the, you know, for the protection of the republic and the public good. And that notion of a virtuous man, uh, an ideal, uh, perhaps an unrealizable deal, but a, a ideal, but a man who looks to the public good before private interests was crucial to him and, and in a way that, that formed him and was emulated by people of his age. Now, it's very abstract in a way, and you try to figure out, well, how, you know, how did he come to grips with this? And I, and I actually think it is that experience on the frontier, having to defend people that he didn't have a lot in common with, that in many cases, as he would write, he thought were just despicable people with horrible manners, uh, and their patriotism was, was no good. Uh, it wasn't as any good, it wasn't as good as their beds, and his, their beds were horrible. So, I mean, he would write these things, but then he would write, but I, you know, I will throw down my own life if it, if it, if it helps stop the crying of the women. And, you know, this ability to sort of, uh, that's virtue in a sense, that you're out there putting yourself on the line uh, for people that, ne that you don't even necessarily love in that way. So uh, that, you know, that experience is one that's formative in an early period and, and, and it's clear from his letters that he was seeing himself in that construct of Roman uh, virtue, which was very appealing in fashionable circles, and you know, and he was a young, impressionable man. So he, he had, you know, we think of him as a practical guy, and he was. As a politician, he was practical. As a military leader, he was often practical. But he had these flights of, of, uh, of romance. He was, he was a revolutionary, after all, uh, and in many cases, he was ahead of his time and in utopian in his vision of how you could bring the West into connection with the East. So. What I have a question there I'd like to ask. What would have happened to Washington had he, the British captured him? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, well, so the one example would be, you know, the Scottish rising in 45, uh, that Culloden and, you know, the, the, the Bonnie Prince Charlie, and they executed a lot of those people, but they pardoned a lot of them as well. Another example would be, you know, the, one, some of the signers, one signer of the Declaration of Independence that they captured in New Jersey, they basically got him to uh, make an oath to the king and, and, uh, and reject his signature. Um, but I, I, with, in Washington's case, uh, it, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, Lawrence was in the Tower of London for a long time. You could have just been executing him as well. And I, I think they would have had a hard time uh, just sort of executing him summarily. And that's, it, it, it is hard to say. He wasn't captured, though. You asked me these impossible questions. I know, but he would, know. He would have had a great def he would have had a great defender in Edmund Burke. Yes, he would have had defenders. I mean, he, oh, the, the, the Whigs Whig would have defended. were wearing uh, buff and blue, so the colors of the Continental Army. And he, you know, he was, he, he was very much attendant to the notion that he was running a proper 18th century European army. That he, you know, he, he had the proper hierarchy and rank. They're emulating the French manners of the, of the aristocratic armies of, the, of Europe. And, you know, he was behaving properly with prisoners of war. And he rejected any effort to, to create a larger partisan <coughs> war, you know, to, to create a, a more of a, 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 war, a guerrilla style war which one of his high, high commanders, Charles Lee, was advocating 
from the beginning, was that you can't fight them on European terms, so just go to the woods, go to the back country, they'll never be able to get you in your high places. And Washington always rejected that because he saw that as a, as a way to assure that the French wouldn't support him and that ultimately the cause couldn't be won uh, in honorable ways. You know, so, so that probably would have protected him ultimately. Well, that's why I asked the question because yeah. of the Whig support of him. Yeah, and yeah. That he had a, he had a, he had a, a fan club in, in England that's at right. the time. That's right. And in fact, he would have a fan club in England throughout the 19th century. I mean, Victorian England loved Washington. Uh, emulated him in many ways, wrote about him, and, and that's a story that really hasn't been well told. Uh, he was a popular, popular figure. You go to Trafalgar Square, of course, there's a, there's a statue of Washington that, that's there that, that's supposed to the, you know, the Anglo-American alliance of the late 19th and, uh, and ongoing, um, but uh, that enthusiasm for Washington was a, a big part of Victorian England. I am struck by the comment that it was about honor, though. Mm. I'm reminded of Robert E. Lee, who essentially made the same argument that they needed to take the North on honorably, right? right? That, that, and I think that powerful, one always has to keep in mind they almost did lose the revolution, and, yeah. <laughs> and it, partly because they fought in the style of the European uh, armies, which they really were pretty badly outmatched by one of the great armies of, of the time. Mm -hmm. And so it is an intriguing you know, un unwillingness to, in some sense, take the opportunity to be a true frontiers guy, guerrilla yeah. guy, yeah. right? And, and it's uh, very different in the 20th century than in the 18th, I think, and it reminds us yeah. of that. Anybody else out there with a question? Here. Yeah. Um, when we go, we're we're going to take this last question, and then we're going to be done. When Wa Washington became president, uh, he picked one of the best, probably, cabinets we've ever had. Um, and Hamilton and Jefferson, who were part of that cabinet, uh, cabinet came from totally different ideolo ideologies. How did Washington sort of balance um, between these two extremes um, to come up with really practical um, policies and, and implement them. Well, uh, the first thing is when Washington uh, became president uh, and he sought out his cabinet, he was trying to get men that he knew could do the job and men that had different regional affiliations. So Hamilton from New York, uh, Henry Knox, of course, his great commander in, uh, in the Revolution, the artillery commander, uh, was from Massachusetts. Uh, Jefferson was from Virginia, and the Attorney General, uh, Edmund Randolph, had been governor of Virginia. So there's two Virginians in there, and he knew all these guys well. He had worked with them closely in different parts of his life. Uh, Knox and Hamilton, of course, in the war. Jefferson, a fellow Virginia politician, and Randolph, in fact, had been his personal attorney for some matters that he was trying to get cleared up. So he wanted guys that he knew could do the job and that had regional diversity. He didn't really know that they had very different views on the future of the country. That sort of emerged as policies had to be put into place. They were all in favor of the Constitution nominally. Uh, even Randolph, who had uh, not signed it at the Constitutional Convention, but then supported it in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, you know, even he had kind of come around. And they were all Republicans. None of them wanted monarchy. So they, in that sense, they all shared the only political ideology that really existed at the time. But once you start putting into place uh, policies. You pick a national bank and you say that that's the direction to go for the financing of the country, and it, which is Hamilton's point of view, and Jefferson <laughs> says, well, that's unconstitutional, there's nothing in the Constitution that says we can create a bank. Then you start getting splits, and these splits are magnified uh, and polarized by the French Revolution in, cru in crucial ways. And I think Jefferson's experience in France was crucial in making him very different from Washington, ultimately, uh, in the way he worried about the future of the republic in ways that Washington didn't worry about it in the same way. When Jefferson's in Paris, it's a city of great extremes, of massive poverty uh, on a grand scale and of luxury and sumptuousness on a scale that couldn't be imagined in America. The, the Palace of Versailles is unbelievable. If, if you've been there, you know. There's nothing like that in 18th century Philadelphia or something, you know. Uh, you know so, so Jefferson says, this is what America will turn into if 
these policies are put into place at this early period. And Hamilton never sees it like that, and Washington doesn't either. But that deep uh, fissure is reflected throughout the country with different points of view and different visions. So that, that you know, the cabinet, he didn't imagine it as a team of rivals. It starts turning into that. But to his great credit, he actually succeeds throughout his first term and through most of his second term with that original cabinet of some great characters and personalities. And, and he, he works with them very frankly. I mean, he gets them in a room and has them argue it out, and then he decides what he's going to do. And although kind of common uh, popular knowledge believes he kind of went with Hamilton most of the time, in fact, he didn't always go with Hamilton. He, he often went away from Hamilton, although in major issues, Hamilton was successful early on, which led to the creation of an opposition party to Hamilton, led by Jefferson and, and James Madison. And so uh, this, uh, as, it, as it emerged and became more polarized, uh, he grew very weary of it and uh, disgusted. And, uh, and was greatly concerned about the opposition that emerged against him. But ultimately, when he resigned uh, his second term, his legacy was one of nonpartisanship, as he points out in his farewell address. His farewell address to the country is a great plea for uh, patience with political difference, which should always exist in a free country, but that when it gets to a point where it, it's creating uh, destabilization and, uh, and a lack of administration, uh, then you, you see that you've gone too far. So, a long answer to a very good question. Although, I, one of the things to keep in mind is that it is the first cabinet. Yeah, I mean, exactly. we look back upon that cabinet and see what happens in the early 19th, 18th, 19th century, yeah. rather than imagine what it's like at that moment. Yeah. These people mostly knew each other, so. Would you join me in thanking Doug and Kevin, please?